Points North Institute. My name is Benjamin Fowley. I'm the Executive and Artistic Director of the Points North Institute. I'd like to thank you all for joining us this evening. There's no question these uncertain times we are living through continue to both be unique and challenging. There's also no question that storytelling is an incredible way to bring people and communities together in exciting and new ways. I think tonight's gathering is a testament to that. You can't stop great storytelling and you certainly can't stop the impact of a really good film that reminds us why we love cinema. Like our friends at Newport Film, Sip and Points North have been built on experiences. Our documentary festival has been around for 16 years and during that time we screened thousands of documentary films to attendees from every corner of the world here on the coast of Maine, which is where I am right now. And it's finally feeling like spring, hopefully a little bit further along in Newport, Rhode Island. Over the past several years under our parent organization, the Points North Institute, we've developed a suite of artist programs that are discovering and nurturing the next generation of nonfiction storytellers. Each year, those programs are supporting over 65 filmmakers. Uh, it's been two months now since we transitioned to online programming. And while it's different, we're also really, really, really grateful for moments like these. Sharing work like this with audiences is a special treat. It's kind of the, the moment we as curators all wait for. Uh, so we will certainly take what we can get in terms of how we can share stories with you. Uh, I want to just say one thing. The director of this film is uh, about as close to prolific as you can get working today. Uh, our special moderator for the night will formally introduce him, but I encourage you all to please dig into his extensive body of work after this conversation tonight. Uh, it'll, it'll blow your mind. And we all need a little bit of that. Uh, in this quick transition into, into digital, virtual, or online, whatever you'd like to, to use, what we've learned is that collaboration is everything, and it is going to be everything going forward. Now more than ever, we need to work together to build community around storytelling, and that is why we're so excited for tonight's partnership. Uh, I want to thank Andrea, I want to thank Becca, and the entire team at Newport Films, uh, who I believe share our curatorial vision and our curiosity, and we are excited and look forward to sharing many more events like this throughout the summer. If you're interested in what we do at the Kim and Film Fest and Points North Institute, please visit our website at pointsnorthinstitute.org. We are screening films weekly uh, and bringing kind of new podcast ideas to the forefront as well, telling stories about what's happening locally around the COVID epidemic here in Midcoast, Maine. I'd like to now introduce uh, my dear friend and colleague, Andre Van Buren, who I rarely get to see outside of the, the snowy, snowy hills of Park City. Uh, so it's a real joy to, to say hello. And uh, again, thank you so much for, for helping us put this evening together. Thank you, Ben. And uh, thanks so much to the Camden International Film Festival and also to the team at NEON. Uh, just a quick note to the Camden viewers that Newport Film is a year-round documentary screening series based in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, we are heading into our 11th year and we usually offer an outdoor summer program called Newport Film Outdoors. Um, that program, which usually runs from mid-June through mid-September, offers people the opportunity to picnic and watch documentaries outdoors on the lawns of many of the Gilded Age mansions owned by the Newport Preservation Society. We also screen films on the grounds of Newport Polo and in many public parks and uh, on beaches. Um, we are hoping this summer to be able to offer a few drive-in screenings, but we are really still in a holding pattern on that. Uh, but do uh, check out our program at newportfilm.com um, for details going forward. Um, so we're, we're really thrilled about this collaboration. It's exciting. We have more films to come with Camden and we, Ben and I are gonna work on kind of the right timing for, for each film, and that should be continuing um, through uh, August at this point. Um, so um, we are thrilled to have the director and producer of Spaceship Earth with us tonight, uh, along with one of the Biospherians uh, from the film, and here to uh, moderate the discussion uh, is Variety's own Brent Lang. Uh, Brent is the executive director of film and media, covering all the major Hollywood studios, as well as their corporate parents. Uh, Brent is a graduate of Brown University, go Rhode Island, uh, and Columbia, the Columbia University School of Journalism. Welcome, Brent. Thanks for having me. It's, it's great to be back, and I'm so happy that you guys have come up with an innovative way to continue uh, your programming in these, in these really uncertain and, and terrible times. Uh, it's my great privilege to be joined tonight by uh, the filmmakers behind uh, Spaceship Earth, as well as one of the subjects. Um, we're here with Matt Wolf, 
uh, who is the director of Spaceship Earth. And Matt's feature documentaries include Wild Combination about the cult cellist and disco producer Arthur Russell and Teenage about early youth culture and the birth of teenagers. And his recent film Recorder is about activist Marion Stokes, who secretly recorded television 24 hours a day for 30 years. Uh, we're also joined by Stacy Reese. Uh, Stacy's an Emmy Award winning filmmaker. Uh, among her uh, films, her credits, uh, is The Perfection, starring Allison Williams, which premiered on Netflix in May of 2019, as well as the extraordinary documentary, The Eagle Huntress, uh, which premiered at Sundance Film Festival and was released uh, by Sony Pictures Classics. Her other credits include Tokyo Project, Suited, The Diplomat, and I Knew It Was You. And we're also joined by one of the subjects um, of this movie, one of the people, one of the Biospherians who spent two years involved in, and I think what anyone who's seen this movie uh, would admit it was a really audacious experiment, and that's Mark Nelson. So it's a real thrill to have you all with us this evening. Um, I guess to start, uh, Matt, I'm, I'm kind of interested in, and Stacy as well, what story did you think you were telling when you first started making Spaceship Earth? And and how did the story change as you made the film? Well, um, Stacy probably remembers the night I came across these startling images of eight people in bright red jumpsuits standing in front of a glowing glass pyramid. And I thought they were stills from a science fiction film, but it didn't take me long to realize that in fact, this structure is real and that eight, these eight people had lived inside of it. And I immediately texted Stacy dozens of pictures from Biosphere 2, um, and we were determined to tell their story. I think initially we assumed that Biosphere 2 was the whole story, this, this kind of um, Big Brother-like expedition and adventure, which had largely been rebuked from the media. Um, there were cult accusations of... Uh, the people who conceived of the project. But um, as we looked into it, we came to know Mark Nelson, who just joined us, one of the bio Biospherians, as well as the other people who conceived of Biosphere 2, who uh, we, we called the Synergists. And Stacy and I um, went to Synergia Ranch, and I'll let her, her say what happened at that point. Well, Matt and I got on a plane to New Mexico. We were really determined to make this film and met with Mark and a number of other people who were involved in the Biosphere 2 project. And um, they gave us a tour of the ranch and brought us to this closet and opened up this closet door. And, and inside were hundreds of tapes, 60 millimeter video cassettes. I mean, every format you can imagine. And they said, well, is this of interest to you? Because we've been filming what we've been doing for 50 years. And it was like documentary gold mine. I mean, Matt and I looked at each other and we were determined to make this movie already, but then we were even more determined to make the movie. I mean, is that pretty rare to have that amount of archival footage? That seems pretty unprecedented to me, but I, I, I don't make documentaries. I, you know, I make films that have lots of archival footage. So um, to me, it's not um, an anomaly, but the quality and character of this archival footage was really extraordinary. Um, Marie Harding, one of the people who was part of the Synergist group and, and the group who, who conceived of Biosphere 2, she was a very talented cinematographer and starting in the 60s, she was filming this group's activity on 16 millimeter film, often from multiple angles and with in a very cinematic way. And she, um, you know, said to me that she recognized that what this group was doing and, and her community was was history and that she wanted to capture it because she thought it would be important for the future. And so it felt like such a great opportunity and also a big responsibility to use that material. But then we realized that the Biospherian Dr. Roy Walford had also been filming inside. And um, he had hundreds of hours of footage that, that documented the day-to-day -day life of the Biospherians. So um, so it's, it's a really Byzantine story with so many twists and turns, and it's so rare that those types of stories um, have archival footage to cover the entire thing. So it was, it was very lucky for us. I know you said that you came across an image of, um, of the Biospherians and, and that's sort of what triggered this. 
did you have much of a memory about the the biosphere uh too because i have to admit i mean i was a, a child in the 90s other than biodome i i really don't remember this at all um and so that's partly why i really loved this film what was your sort of uh recollections about that well, I was nine years old during the first mission and I had no recollection of Biosphere 2. I was encountering it for the first time when I saw images on the internet. So, um, you know, I'm really interested in these sort of hidden histories, stories that uh, had a lot of exposure, or were very big in a certain time, but have faded from collective memory. And 25 years had passed. It felt really ripe for reappraisal in the context of catastrophic climate change. And then of course, as Stacy is describing, when we went to Synergia Ranch and encountered this vast archive, um, we realized that this prehistory of Biosphere 2 was really fascinating and that to trace the ideas, experiences, and adventures that led towards this epic experiment, um, I think could really deepen themes about a group of people who really strive to literally reimagine a world. Uh, Mark, I don't know if you're still having trouble with audio, but if you can hear me, um... I can, I can hear you. Oh, great. Um, so, I mean, did you have any uh, reservations about participating in this project? Because at least based on the film, it, it seemed as though the media coverage of what you guys were doing sort of missed the point and was, and was pretty brutal, frankly. Uh, so were you wary at all of, of you know, re-entering the public sphere with this? Uh, of course we were wary. Uh, but we did our homework. Uh, fortunately, uh, The Eagle Huntress was a film that almost all of us had seen quite recently uh, before the contact. Stacy had high marks as the producer of that. I did my little test with uh, Matt. I said, uh, I'll send you a PDF of my last book on Biosphere 2, and we'll talk after you read it. And he passed. He was actually serious enough to read and and uh, begin to understand the complexity of Biosphere 2. You know, so we did our checkout and uh, of course we want, you know, it's such an amazing story that hasn't been told that we're receptive to it. And I think Matt and Stacy exceeded our expectation. It's a fantastic film. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, Matt and Stacy, what was, what was your pitch to uh, to folks, I mean, how did you have to try to get their trust, and was was that difficult? Uh, it sounds like Mark was was on board relatively early, but what about others? I remember the first night we met Mark; he was really quizzing us. It wasn't that straightforward. <laughs> I think a lot of people have tried to make this film over the years, and I think the biggest way that I try to build trust is by doing my homework instead of just assuming somebody should trust me or that I'll learn as I'm talking to them. I try to really read everything that's been written about a project or a person and to understand everything they've said about their work and to really contemplate what I can add to the conversation. And Stacy and I went deep into the history of Biosphere 2 and recognized that there was a prevailing media narrative about the project and that we came with the intention of reappraising the story to find meaning in what this group of people had done, but also to find meaning in the, um, the the discounting and rebuking of the project too. I thought both things were important, not just to reappraise Biosphere 2, but to to really understand why it was considered a failure and what the implications of that were. And I think for me, I mean, my background is before I was a filmmaker, I worked for NBC News and not during this time, actually. I mean, I was still in college when the Biosphere 2 project first um, started, but I was really interested in using this time, these two years that it took to make the film and to do this deep dive into um, what this story was. And I think what often happens with the news coverage is, you know, you don't have that time to really understand what the story is. So, you know, we spent a lot of time, we made many trips to New Mexico and other places, spent a lot of time with the people that were involved in the story. And that was one of the things that was really rewarding to me in terms of having the time um, to really, really do a deep dive and look back at this story that took place 25 years ago, but with a contemporary point of view. Why do you think the media coverage um, at the time was so savage and dismissive? Um, what, what was it about this project that that uh, 
you know, elicited that kind of, um, I guess, antipathy almost. Uh, should I make a, a stab at that? Sure. So, you know, Biosphere 2 is pretty radical. We were totally unprepared. I think the film captures that pretty well. Uh, and we weren't very savvy uh, in communicating the reality of what we were trying to do. So uh, there is also a game that especially the American media play is that they build a project up and then, oh, lo and behold, we can find a uh, hole in it. Uh, you know, it's not all it, it's cracked up to be. We're great investigative journalists. So we were played a bit like a yo-yo, you know, the coverage was very, very over the top for two or three years. And then it kind of, uh, you know, turned on a dime. And, I, you know, I think we made mistakes because it, we shouldn't have let the project be trivialized to uh, a contest of whether the two years would be a success by the terms of succeeding in, in no entry and no exit. Um, we, we could have done a much better job in sharing with everyone the absolute unknowns that we were stepping into because we had no expectations, even the eight people who went in, that we could stay in there for two years. And, you know, so the, the project became very trivialized. I, I think the media, certainly to blame, I mean, I, I remember struggling with, this is not a space colony that is not the purpose of it. This is a long-term experiment. And the, the Earth Laboratory is equally as important as space applications. But it was a hard story to get across for mass media because of its complexity and its subtlety. And also, I think there was a growing appetite for a kind of voyeuristic entertainment that this is before reality television really took hold. It's also before the internet. It's a story that went viral in a sense, but uh, I read a New York Times headline that when the real world launches, they said it was MTV's answer to Biosphere 2. And there's always been rumors that John DeMol, the creator of the Big Brother TV show, um, got his ideas from, um, from Biosphere 2 satellite uplinks. And of course, the television show um, Survivor comes to mind, um, considering all the ecological challenges inside. But I think the public was looking at this as a human experiment. And to some extent, it was. But the word experiment is really loaded. I think it has associations with academia and governmental applications, with a hypothesis-driven, small-scale, reductionist science. But also, this group was interested in what one of, one of the people interviewed in the film, Kathleen Gray, called a lifetime experiment. They were artists and adventurers, and they were also ecologists and scientists. And this multidisciplinary project with all of its complex goals, I think really was redefining and reimagining what an experiment could be. And there was a lot of spectacle and also a lot of rigor and that it's hard for the media to see all of the nuance of that. I, I certainly see the parallels with reality television. Um, I wonder, it, it seems sort of telling to me that I've, uh, this starts in 1991. Um, do, you, do you see a link as well with this kind of like uh, drive-by uh, tabloidification of news that happened in the early 90s with uh, Lorena Bobbitt and with uh, Nancy Kerrigan and, and OJ where, you know, there was almost a uh, sort of a, a move into pulpiness in the way that, that media covered things. Stacy, you might have. Yeah, I mean, I think that. it was, those stories all interestingly were around that time period. And so I think what, you know, happened with Biosphere 2 is was such a big spectacle and it, it garnered so much attention and so quickly. And then there just became this appetite to cover like who was sleeping with who and who was, you know, what people were eating and like all the aspects of the story that, you know, had nothing to do with the science, which is what the Biospherians wanted to focus on. And people were only focused on all those other aspects of it. Um, so I do think that there was, you know, if you watch some of the old clips from that time, there is like a tabloid um, miss to how that story was covered. Uh, and do you think that, uh, Mark, do you think it would have been different now uh, in the advent of social media um, the fact that you could have, like you were saying, 
uh, potentially had some more transparency into what it was you were trying to accomplish. And in some ways, I suppose, control your own narrative more. Yeah, no, I, I remember during the two years, I became very fond of, uh, t you know, talk radio shows because they had a longer time where you could actually have an intelligent conversation about what was going on. We, at the last minute, have had media training. And, you know, if you're not in that world and you, you suddenly get told, well, you've got to go into uh, interviews, especially with, you know, mainline TV and, you know, reel back before, you know, before all of the communication channels we have now, that you have to say something intelligent in eight to 10 seconds, that's really challenging. <laughs> that's really challenging. Uh, and we did the best we could. Uh, you know, on, on the flip side, uh, the images of Biosphere 2 went out there. And I'm so glad that we won the fight with our engineers who wanted to make a big box, you know, simple biosphere that'd be easy for the engineers to construct. And we said, no way, you know, we may be nuts, but, you know, if we're going to, if we're going to be this daring, we're going to build a beautiful biosphere. The fact that Biosphere 2 captured the world's imagination, that's why the media came. And I remember quite well, it was actually European magazines and newspapers that first came somehow or other and, and ran stories and then set off this pilgrimage of people who came to Biosphere 2 wanting to see what it was like, you know, try to wrap their minds around a biosphere. And that catapulted us into biosphere education. So the images and the story of Biosphere 2 got out there, even, you know, with the crappy way that the media was treating us. If we did the project now, everyone would totally get, and it wouldn't seem radical, that learning to build a biosphere and figure out how humans and farms and technology can live with wilderness systems in peace, you know, without polluting each other, it would be so obvious that this was important. So we used to joke, we're 50 years ahead of the curve here. We're 50 years ahead of our time, but it's just amazing and as scary as some of the destruction is, it's so encouraging that the world dialogue has has progressed so so rapidly. Yeah, I almost would say you're 30 years ahead uh, or something. Okay. I mean, what what is it like um, to be releasing this film about kind of the ultimate type of social isolation at a time of social isolation and, and in the midst of the coronavirus? I mean, it's uncanny. We we premiered the film at Sundance in January and couldn't have possibly imagined the circumstances in which people would really see it. And I think Stacy and I really felt that the film was prescient um, because of the way it, it approaches the issue of climate change. And also there is a contemporary political scoop in the final act of the film <laughs> that really makes the metaphor of biosphere to a, a kind of contemporary political dilemma as well. Um, but of course, now the similarities are uncanny in, in so many senses. A lot of us are living like the biospherians, you could say. And I think, um, you know, a lot of people have been asking about that. And I was really struck by what Mark said at the reentry ceremony, and I'm sure he could elaborate on it. He said, um, living in a small enclosed world changes who you are. And that idea of personal transformation, I think, is really instructive and inspiring. This idea that um, we can be transformed by the experience of quarantine that we're having now and reassess the impact we have on the outside world when quarantine ends and that we may feel a renewed sense of accountability to each other and also appreciate the um, positive environmental effects that have come from this pause. I mean, these are these are questions that we can hope um, come to the fore as, as we're in this difficult time. Uh, Mark, I wonder what, what, what did your experience uh, in the biosphere, how did that prepare you for, I assume you're quarantining like, like the rest of us, how did that sort of prepare you for this? And have people asked you for advice about, about how to get through these really strange times? Yeah, we, I, I guess we have some insights into it. You know, fortunately, I'm in kind of a group isolation at uh, Sinugia Ranch. 
you know, we're 20 miles outside of town. And, and when, you know, the, the shutdown happened, we had about a dozen people, you know, starting our organic farm operations for the year. So it's not quite like we're combined into a small apartment. I, I do find it, you know, like eerily strange that Spaceship Earth should come out at a time like this and ever being the forcing myself to be optimistic. Uh, I think, you know, as Matt was saying, I, I think it's a, a great inflection point. It's sort of such a shock to the system to suddenly have half of America and a good part of uh, Western Europe, you know, shut down and business as usual, which is killing the planet, has now been halted, shockingly. And, you know, we have a project in London, my Institute of Ecotechnics, and people there are talking about how London air is improving and skies are blue. And in Biosphere 2, we had the experience of going into a really, really healthy world where we were responsible for keeping it vibrant and healthy because our lives and our well-being depended on it. We're in a different situation in the world, but, you know, for just the small delay or, or slowdown of business, we're seeing that nature can respond. We're going to meet our uh, Paris CO2 uh, agreement accords worldwide for the first time because of this shock, that maybe we can rethink how we live with the earth, what, we, what kind of an earth we want to share. Uh, that would be a wonderful uh, side effect of all of this. Um, I, I should have asked you before, but the film also talks about sort of the scientific community and their skepticism about what you guys were doing. Um, why do you think they were so hostile uh, to, to what you were doing? What, what did they sort of, I mean, did they get something wrong about what, what you were trying to accomplish? Well, I don't think the scientific community was hostile. We had, you know, we uh, had all Dismissive, kinds. Dismissive, I should probably say, maybe. Uh, but that dismissive, maybe not hostile. No, I, but I, you know, there isn't a scientific community. But Biosphere Two is controversial for a lot of reasons, and one of the reasons was that, in addition to all of the detailed, you know, so-called reductionist or analytic science that had to be right in engineering, it was a holistic uh, experiment. You know, we were looking at biomic areas. We were looking at a series of biomes connected at the large scale. And large scale science is uh, very underfunded. And it's kind of controversial because a lot of reductionist scientists really don't understand it. So some of our champions, uh, and by the way, there, there's a new book, a reissue of Life Under Glass, which I'm going to hold up. <laughs> which is the inside story of Biosphere 2. It, three of the Biospherians, including myself, wrote it while we were inside, and now we've updated it uh, at, you know, with a really prescient look back on why was it important? Why does it still have relevance? We had a lot of friends in the space community and in the science community, and a lot of scientists told us we would get called by newspapers, and if we didn't have anything negative to say about bias for two, they said, could you suggest someone who, who would? So uh, a lot of the criticism that you read about is kind of overblown. Uh, and, you know, certainly all of the scientists who came to bias for two, even as visitors, were blown away when they really understood what the, what the experiment was about. We were outsiders. This was a problem. What we were doing, amazingly enough, is kind of a taboo. We had people in the experiment, and you know, supposedly this ruins your objectivity. And apparently back 30 years ago, studying people and the environment is kind of beyond the, the bounds of jurisdictional uh, small-scale science. That's what I'm saying. Now, if we do this experiment, human ecology and obviously studying the human impact on our biosphere, they're like not only front page news, but world science is mobilizing to to study and come up with solutions. Uh, Matt, what, what do you think, uh, or Stacy? I mean, about the scientific sort of reception at the time and, and would it have changed, do you think? Has it changed? 
uh, in the ensuing years? Well, less of an issue of science and it's more, I think, that this idea of a kind of gregarious personality with a group of outliers who is operating with a financier on a private venture that's futurist in nature, um, that's exploring something unknown like Mars colonization, it all sounds very familiar, someone like Elon Musk. But this is a little bit before dot-com culture. Um, the, the kind of jargon that would have been used is disruptors. Um, you know, someone like Mark Zuckerberg says that people like to, uh, his ethos is to break things. So a lot of the ethos of dot-com culture I see present in John Allen as a leader and in, in the aspirations and futurism of the project. So um, I think that non-institutional private venture exploration is something that we, we've come to accept and appreciate more now. Not to mention that, you know, they also were part of this theater group. And so this experimental theater combined with science, I mean, now we think of it as like a STEM or STEAM education and this interdisciplinary nature of what they were doing. But all of this was very sort of unusual for the time. Um, I assume that most of the people watching this have, have seen the film. So I, I don't really want to do a spoiler, but you have one of the sort of the great third act twists the, of, of any film I've seen in recent years, which is that Steve Bannon kind of emerges as a central uh, character slash antagonist. Uh, I, I don't even know how to phrase a question around this really, but first of all, how did, how did that happen? And Mark, what did you think when Steve Bannon reemerges in the political scene as this you know, Trump's brain. Yeah, the Steve Bannon who uh, appeared recently is quite different than the one that uh, <laughs> that we had to contend with. And I do have to say that, you know, that power struggle, which eventuated in the takeover of Biosphere 2, my group were, you know, we were not just managers. We were co-owners with uh, Ed Bass of the facility. Uh, and, you know, we were trying to reposition it. We had made a lot of... Uh, progressive changes about how it was going to operate. Uh, but, you know, Steve Bannon was, you know, much more cosmetically appealing. But ultimately, you know, he is out of Wall Street. He's a kind of a takeover expert. And the takeover that was happening uh, really polarized uh, my team inside, our team inside Biosphere 2. We would have had difficulty, you know, it was just hard to live with just seven people for two years. But when the power struggle on the outside began to reach inside and, and people on both sides were, were you know, trying to get the biospherians aligned on one side or the other, that made things much, much more difficult. And I, I do think it's kind of ironic, uh, you know, in a word, uh, here's my, my sound bite. Steve Bannon destroyed one world, the small world, and now apparently he and his allies are working on destroying the, the large world, the one that we all live in. Uh, and, and sort of your interactions with him, did you see any of the seeds of the kind of climate denying, uh, I don't even really, pseudo populist, whatever uh, philosophy that he sort of espouses now? No, <laughs> I certainly didn't. Uh, but I didn't have that much, you know, I. I think the first time I met him physically was after we came out. There was a series of VIPs, including Stanley Buckthall, who is a long-term friend and one of the producers of, this, of these film. And Sally and I took these people in their, you know, in their three-piece suits through Biosphere, and they were all sweating profusely. And Sally and I, of course, this was our world. You know, we were totally comfortable <laughs> with it. So, you know. We, you know, I've been tracking uh, Steve Bannon. He was a Kennedy Democrat, a, you know, a good Irish kid from the East Coast. Uh, his transformation has been pretty strange to uh, to observe from afar. Uh, Matt, what did you think when that sort of detail came out in your research, uh, or, or Stacy too? I mean, it's a it's a get. I mean, to, it provides an incredible metaphor. For the film, the takeover of Biosphere 2 is like the takeover of Biosphere 1, the, 
the political and economic forces that be um, destroy vanguard ideas and show the limits of, you know, idealism. And, um, you know, in a, in a sense, it, it's tragic that this project ended, but I saw a metaphor that is apt to um, describe the circumstances today that, that threaten our survival on the planet. Um, you sort of make the point at the end, uh, and, I, and I'm paraphrasing, but that, that there's something sort of tragic about how this idealism became corporatized, that, that corporate culture came in and uh, sort of you know, t t took it took advantage of it. I mean, did you feel that at the time, Mark? And Matt, was that sort of a, a, a sub, uh, in the subtext of, of what you were trying to say as well? Well, uh, you know, I'm sure I have a different take on it because uh, I knew Ed, you know, for decades. He was a director of our Institute of Ecotechnics, our ecological arm. And, you know, I knew very well that he, uh, kept the usual Wall Street types happy by saying that most of his money, 95% of it, was invested in the usual ways, profit maximization. And I do think that that kind of large-scale capitalism is a good part of the destruction and the ongoing degradation of our planet. But Ed, you know, is, was a, is a maverick. He's a really wonderful man with great vision and great love of ecology, which the film brings out. But he always said, you know, I reserve 5% of my wealth to do visionary projects, to do philanthropic and phil ecology projects that do benefit and pay back for the environment. So although it was a private venture, Biosphere 2, we were quite aware that we were doing, you know, fundamental research that would be valuable for people around the planet. It was a private venture with a lot of public benefits uh, inherent. Of course, we wanted Biosphere 2 to make back the investment. We thought that would happen by selling Biospheres to LA, London, Tokyo, Euro, Disney, et cetera, and by spin-off technologies. And in, in a way, it's really a pity. I think a lot of pressure came on Ed and his family because of the negative media publicity. I think that was more of an issue than the expenditures. Biosphere 2 is a remarkable that we could build this facility and research it and do everything for 10 years for less than the cost of one military uh, jet plane. It was quite a bargain. And I think that e ecologists should get the resources that we put into fundamental research like cyclotrons. In fact, we called Biosphere 2 a cyclotron for the, for the life sciences. We're starting to get some uh, questions about, uh, fr from, from our viewers. Um, one of them is, uh, why were there three acres under the dome? What was, what was the, uh, the, the reason for that? Uh, and why so many people in such a small environment? Um, this is from Mary Van Buren, uh, and she asks: Was there a was there an effort to uh, was there a conscious decision to limit hard science details in the film? So three. There, cer there certainly wasn't a conscious effort to limit anything, but it's not a miniseries; it's a, it's actually a two hour film. So we had to really focus what what we were doing in the storytelling and a lot of it was about trying to understand the intentions and ambitions behind the project to understand biosphere 2 both as a practical science experiment and as a metaphor but also to really chart the the saga of biosphere 2 in the media and and to find meaning in its downfall so we wanted people to understand um what the method of the science was, what the intentions of it were, and to understand the constraints that Mark and the other biospherians lived under. But there's all sorts of other interesting stuff. Uh, we were at the Smithsonian today talking about microbes and how they affected the atmosphere. Um, you know, there's the whole food chain supply and how that affected the thousands of plants and species that were brought inside. So there's all sorts of really fascinating details that we could have gone into, but we had to make tough choices. And I think, I always feel like in a documentary, if, if it leaves people with more questions, 
um, it's something to chew on, both in terms of ideas, but it also is an opportunity to, to dive in, to dig deeper. And I think um, it allows people to continue that exploration. And that's part of what interests me about filmmaking. Should I say something about the three acres? You know, in fact, it's kind of funny. I'm, I'm now reminded when we were launching and having preliminary meetings with scientists and engineers to say, is it even doable to, to think about making a mini biosphere that would be materially closed and energetically and informationally open? Our first conception would, it was that it would be maybe a 15 to $30 minute, million dollar project and it would cover the size of a tennis court. Uh, but then we learned that, for example, plastic doesn't is not airtight. Co even concrete isn't airtight. And as we began developing uh, the project with the idea that we would have not a model of planet Earth, but a biospheric laboratory, then it was really essential that we had a series of wilderness areas. And the challenge for the ecologists were to make something that would have the feel and function of a rainforest on half an acre. You know, can you do a living coral reef in an ocean that's only 40 feet long? So, you know, rather than uh, being surprised that it was three acres, to me, what was just astonishing was what brilliant engineers and world-class ecologists, our, our, our extended team who, who made and researched bias for two, what they could pack into one tiny, I think it's about the size of two football fields, you know, and we had such a range of wilderness areas, a beautiful farm and living habitat. And then we raised the ceilings because when you start to look at uh, life and, you know, you're thinking about a hundred year experiment, how tall can you get trees to grow? So we had 75 foot ceilings you know, a space frame in the rainforest and 40 feet elsewhere. So over decades, our trees could grow to maturity. Uh, let's get another question, uh, if we can. So um, we have a question from Kareem Durdag uh, from Scarborough, Maine. Um, and he asks, what are some lessons vis-a-vis human interactions that Mark learned in his experience and what challenges did Matt and Stacy face in telling the story? Stacy, do you want to talk about the challenges? Yeah, sure. Why don't I talk about some of the challenges and then Mark can talk about his lessons learned. I mean, we touched on some of them. I mean, one of the challenges as in making any documentary film is gaining the trust of the people that we want to make the film about. And, you know, given that what had happened in this story and how much time had gone by, obviously, you know, we, it took us some time to gain their trust and, and give us access. One of the other huge challenges is there was 600 hours of material, which we needed to distill down into, you know, a under two hour film. And that material that we talked about earlier wasn't organized in any way. And so, you know, we hired a team of people to go and really organize all this archival material and create this like Dewey Decimal type library system before we could even really start making the film. We needed to understand what there was and what those assets were and how we would be able to view them. So that was, you know, an enormous challenge in, in making the film. Anything else you want to add, Matt? No, I think that those were those the, are the challenges. big challenges. Uh, the lessons learned, my my goodness, uh, that's why I keep writing books about it because it was such an amazing experience that seriously, 25 years later, I'm still digesting uh, what it was like and what it meant to be a biosphere in. But in brief, uh, you know, and that's another aspect that, you know, what can you do in two hours that's only briefly touched on is it was an amazing transformation for me and the seven other people because... There was no operating. There was no operating manual. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to leave in a few minutes. There was no operating manual of how to be a biospherian or how to operate biosphere two, and the really amazing thing, which I think has a, a huge amount of re uh, relevance, is that to be a biospherian, and we chose that word caref carefully, 
with the idea that eventually, uh, 30 years later, it might not sound too outre to say that everybody listening to this program and everyone not listening to this program, we are all biospherians of, of planet Earth. But in Biosphere 2, our learning curve was really steep because it was such a small system that there were no, no small actions, no anonymous actions. What you did had consequences. And it was so wild to have a system, and it's kind of like the planet Earth, where technology and the living world are so intimately enmeshed. And, you know, among many other stories, uh, and we've, we've discovered this in the test module, an even smaller facility, you know, just to put a trowel into the, into the soil and harvest a sweet potato releases a little pulse of CO2 that you can measure when, you're, when you have an intensely studied system. If you don't screw a little can of PVC glue and solvent and it begins to outgas, you will trace that in your analytic laboratory. And then when you start to do anything technical, it became second nature. We looked at our air analyses to say, can we do this activity? How is our, how is our air? And I think that this is some of the thinking that we really have to have on planet Earth. We now have smog alerts in cities. I'm convinced if people in around the world uh, saw what was in their air and water and what was in their food, they would demand changes. And they would say, what is causing that pollution? So, you know, one of the lessons that I really take from Biosphere 2 is that we can teach engineers to think ecologically. They were great engineers and they were obviously innovative to take on the challenges we gave them, but none of them were used to thinking about a living system to where their engineering solutions, how to pass the test, can it be put in bias for two and not pollute the, the life inside? Can it be part of the support system? So we had to redesign our technosphere to make Biosphere 2 work. That's clearly one of the imperatives if we're gonna change the way human civilization and we affect our global biosphere. Uh, so uh, we also have a question from Steve Murata who says, what is the backstory behind Mark's nickname? <laughs> Uh, okay, well, I wrote another book called The Wastewater Gardener, uh, Preserving the Planet One Flush at a Time. I don't know if I can say this, but it was supposed to be called Holy Shit. That was, that was my working title for it. Well, I was in charge of the sewage system inside Biosphere 2, and I fell in love with our constructed wetlands, got a PhD in the field, and, and built these shit recycling, you know, human wastewater recycling systems around the planet. But I cut my teeth as a 22-year-old city kid in New Mexico, and we built a Sinigia Ranch with a lot of our domestic animal uh, manure, and there was a racetrack that I used to rent dump trucks, and I used to bring over this precious horse manure from 1,200 racehorses, and that's when I got my uh, nickname of Horseshit. And the, the kind of private joke was because I was an Ivy Ivy over educated league graduate from Dartmouth that I was used to spouting bullshit, which doesn't do any anyone any good, but I was actually turning the the horse manure into compost and planting fruit trees and doing some good. So for me, from bullshit to horseshit was a, a major step upward. Uh, let's see if there are some other questions. Uh from Owen Robbins, uh, what has happened to John Allen? John Allen just celebrated his 91st uh, birthday here at Sinergia Ranch. He is much beloved. So, you know, like this call, we had a Zoom call with about 50 or 60 uh, friends around the planet, you know, wishing him well and and all, all like that. He, he's doing great. Uh, he's enjoying his, his 90s. He's he, he can be sharp as a tack. He, his, his lucidity, you know, varies. He has some challenges with short-term memory, but, you know, he's a beautiful old man. And I, I'm so thankful also, Matt and Stacy, that you made this film while John is still with us. 
to see his legacy on the big screen? One of the greatest parts of making this film was premiering it at Sundance Film Festival and having John Allen in the audience and all of you and being able to, you know, watch this story and then see the audience react to it and be able to participate in that. So I know that that was a very moving, moving experience for me and, and seeing him be able to stand up and answer some questions from the audience was, was also incredible. Um, you sort of answered this, but uh, Marsha Brown asked, what are your feelings about Steve Bannon? I don't want to talk anymore about Steve Bannon because there's so many more interesting things to talk about. <laughs> is my is my feeling about it? He, you know, he his work and his legacy. It depends, I guess, on where you stand politically. But Biaser Two is, you know, way more than that coda. I don't see Biaser Two as a tragedy in a way because we were able to have this creative project for you know well on nine years do the most advanced closed ecological system that I go to space conferences and other scientific conferences and, you know, people in the field still take their hats off, you know, to Biosphere 2. So we were able to accomplish an amazing, amazing amount of uh, work and the legacy and the importance of Biosphere 2, I think, only grows. And unfortunately, I have uh, to leave this wonderful uh, conversation and you wonderful people and do some other things right now. Well, I, I think on that note, I want to thank you, Mark and Matt and Stacy, for, for having this uh, conversation with us and uh, for the wonderful film and, and for all you've done. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks. I didn't mean to, to stop the entire conversation, but anyway. <laughs> There's no conversation the without you, Mark. Yeah, you're the star. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Okay, adios, amigos.